In the course of years, I have come to some personal conclusions about our existing troubles, and I'd like to share some of the more particular findings with you this morning. I cannot tell exactly how many persons I have seen and with whom I have discussed their problems. I would guess that it will be close to 10,000. Therefore, actually, from an experienced standpoint, at least within a certain area, I have probably worked with more people than the average clinic in the course of 25 years of management. And out of the observations and reflections based upon this experience, I have arrived at some conclusions which I believe could be helpful if we will do something with them. It's in, it is difficult to tell in exact figures uh, the percentages of persons suffering from different types of difficulty. I think, however, taking a unit of 100 as the basis of calculation, that we can say that five, six, or seven out of this hundred have reached a condition of mental or emotional disorientation, that they are either in danger of or have actually entered into a state of mental disease. For these people, there is no doubt in the world that the best possible chance for recovery lies in the field of psychiatry. Out of this same group of a hundred, there are probably twelve or fifteen who will require a considerable period of counseling. These individuals have involved their affairs in such complex patterns that they are in need of continuous systematic help. Perhaps also we should say that these same uh, persons have become so habitually addicted to certain attitudes that only considerable professional help will help them to clear their own minds. Also, there will always be some persons to whom the principal stimulus to recovery will be economic. Uh, these people will get well quicker if it costs them $25 a session. Uh, they find that uh, uh, they have to give up a great many pleasures, luxuries, and even necessities in order to receive adequate counseling over a period of time. This, however, can certainly be overdone. I know several cases who are now entering their ninth or tenth year of counseling. These people have had too much. And if it has not been possible to help them up to now, the future looks a little uncertain. But out of this hundred we started with, about 80% will be able to help themselves if they can have a certain amount of clear guidance and insight. Most of human beings have built into their own structures protective mechanisms which, if they will use them, will help them to solve their own troubles. Now, the problem of solving your own problem cannot be said to be the most interesting and fascinating of pursuits. It is usually uh, a matter of gradually gaining control 
of our own attitudes and actions. The only possible way of doing this is through some type of self-discipline. In comparison to self-discipline, the best of psychology is a poor second, because actually all that psychoanalysis can really do is to inspire the person in self-improvement or to reveal more clearly the damages caused by present attitudes and thus encourage basic changes of temperament. No one can change his disposition without his own effort. There is no one who can allow someone else to try and grow for them. It is just as impossible as it is for us to expect other people to digest our food and at the same time that it will nourish our own bodies. So out of the reflections and the observations that have built up in my own mind, I believe that about 80% of troubled people can take care of themselves uh, with just a little understanding and a little dedication uh, to the problem. One of the difficulties we have today is to find dedication. Uh, the average person is not uh, so instructed or educated that he realizes the importance of self-orientation. Our very way of life and a very large part of our educational theory inclines toward the creation of weakness. The individual is more and more impelled to turn to others for the various responsibilities and duties which he himself should perform. Thus, perhaps, in order to see the working of this situation, we have to understand the instruction that was given in other times to other peoples where psychological help as we know it was not available. In some mysterious way, the world got along for tens of thousands of years without professional psychological help. Now we can say, and probably with a measure of truth, that the, the world didn't get along too well even then. But I doubt if we could prove that it was any worse off than we are now. I doubt if there's ever been a time when so-called psychological factors were in worse shape than they are today. There has to be a reason for this. There has to be an explanation for it. In the first place, if we go back to older peoples, and even back 50 or 75 years in the life of our own country, we will realize that the world was largely composed of individuals of some kind, individuals who expected to carry a certain burden throughout life. It was not assumed in those days that everyone was in this world simply to do as he pleased. Life was not simply a garden of infinite opportunity. Uh, liberty did not um, justify license, and the person expected to carry his share of the community load, whatever it might be. He expected to sacrifice many of his own personal interests for collective good. He expected to support a family, and the homemaker expected to build a home. These expectations, which were largely the result of our observation of environment, constituted respectability. The individual who did not make a fair showing in his own area of responsibility was regarded as a poor citizen. 
Status at that time meant to do your job and do it as well as you could. Status demanded that the individual live a reasonably adequate existence. In those days also, there were certain powerful general defenses of the individual. The economic situation was nowhere near as strenuous as it is today. Class lines were more definitely enforced. The individual expected to follow along in the trades and professions of his ancestors. He was expected to do the things by which his own family and his own way of life could be supported. Probably not one in a thousand expected to be rich. Not one in a thousand expected a divorce. Not one in a thousand expected to do everything he wanted to do. He was bound by a more or less strict code of personal honor, and he was propped up on all sides by the opinions of society. Society in those days was not uh, the structure of fluxes and changes that we now experience. In those days, individuals lived in a community all their lives. They had the same neighbors from the cradle to the grave. In all probability, they sele selected marriage partners from the neighborhood. Every action, every thought, practically, was a community property. These individuals, therefore, were receiving a very strong social indoctrination, such as it was. Today we consider it smug, decadent, narrow, and to our way of thinking, uh, a compound affliction. But in those days, people did not so view it. They found their way of life just about as satisfactory as we find ours. Because their expectations were moderate, they had very few grievances against the world in which they lived. At that time, nearly all communities, whether Christian or non-Christian, centered around religion. In every little European village, you see the small houses of the citizens clustered about the base of a great cathedral or church that rose in the midst of that community. Of course, in medieval Europe, there was only one church. Therefore, there was very little religious disagreement. But regardless of whether there was one or several churches in the community, the individual uh, was largely dependent upon his religion for his code of life. If difficulties became too heavy for him to bear in his own uh, personal strength, he usually had uh, recourse to the priest or the clergyman. The priest and the clergyman could do very little more than restate for this individual the basic concepts of theological ethics and morality. Uh, the minister or priest could quote the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. He could call, point out to the individual his religious duties. And these religious duties were largely associated with the immediate conduct of his affairs. For him to evade responsibility or attempt to avoid it was inconsistent with his religious conviction. In the old times of the Greeks, uh, religion as we know it today, congregational religion, was comparatively unknown. The temple was available for worship. Those who wished to worship went there individually and made their offerings and their prayers. The, church, the temple, however, maintained um, a group of priests. These priests had as their principal useful function uh, helping 
worshippers to understand simple natural problems. Therefore, to seek advice was merely to go to the ever-available center of religious insight. This advice had particular authority simply because the priest was regarded as the inspired interpreter of the divine will. Whatever the priest recommended would be difficult to contradict. And, of course, it wasn't a problem of going every day and getting a new indoctrination. Uh, the discussion probably terminated with certain moral injunctions. This the person should do. This the person should not do. He went back to his own way of life, convinced that by obeying the traditional rules of his community, he was obeying God, serving God, and keeping faith with his religion. This was a rather powerful force in maintaining a certain kind of social integration. It was much easier uh, to be a reasonably adjusted person if your neighbors were of like nature. It was also not too difficult to keep the rules that they were keeping and in this way share in their respect and admiration. Gradually this whole situation has changed, and by degrees the individual has lost all traditional landmarks. He no longer has the powerful Confucianism of China, with its exact description and delineation of the responsibilities of good personal life, and good community citizenship. We no longer have the uh, wisdom of the Socratic dialogues as something living and vital to us. We no longer have the simple code of Buddhism or the simple structure of the Mosaic Law. Gradually, we have turned our attention uh, to an endless problem of trying to adjust to other situations and conditions, but with no central point of integration within ourselves. As this uh, central point was negative or non-operative, adjustment simply meant to move the whole personality into a new situation. Experience proves that this type of motion does not solve much. The individual takes his problem with him because actually his own lack of insight is his problem. Uh, everything else is merely a result of some form of mistake which he is making in his own conduct. With the central core, however, of community traditional belief missing, and the person less and less inclined to be profoundly influenced by any theological system. The effort has been made to compensate by what might be called a strong secular ethics or morality. This secular ethics is enforced by law, and to a large degree secular morality is also a legal matter but we have never yet been able to prove that law enforcement is adequate. We have never been able to show that law can be a complete preventative of crime or a code sufficient to maintain the integration of human relationships. No matter how many laws we make, we are still burdened with law make, uh, lawbreakers and lawmakers, as far as that's concerned. We have too many laws. We have too many rules, but none of these laws or rules inspire. They do not cause us to feel in our hearts that this is great, good, and important. We are frightened into a certain kind of civil obedience. But secretly, we gradually develop antagonisms against laws which are merely restraints upon private action. As a result of the general prevailing situation, we have also made another gradual compromise. We have produced what we term today the welfare state. 
we have placed the happiness of the individual very largely in the keeping of government. This, of course, is a hopeless prospect, not only from the standpoint of the individual, but from the standpoint of government. The uh, uh, welfare state is not adequate as a solution for the individual lacking the means to create welfare in his own nature. As the result, however, of the gradual development of these protective mechanisms, individual resourcefulness has been seriously damaged. The individual has become more and more of a leaner, more and more dependent upon society for various securities which he should definitely build in his own nature. As he is no longer required uh, to have the same thoughtfulness about his own future, he at the same time loses the instinct to discipline his own conduct to secure that future. Not too long ago, we were a provident people. We were, in a, we were provident because we knew that we had to prepare for the future. We believed that the future was in our own keeping, that if we wish to have com uh, happiness and economic security in advancing years, we had to take a provident attitude. Now, it may well be that the changes in world affairs have gradually undermined the possibility or the probability of man planning his own securities. We realize today that a depression or a war can destroy most of the efforts and labors of individuals. That was true also, to a minor degree at least, in older times, and uh, the constant bickering of princes did much to destroy the peace of mind of the peasant and the shopkeeper. Still, however, the psychology itself operated. The individual believed that his best chance to have something when he needed it was to save it now. This was not important merely because it gradually increased the contents of the family teapot, which was then the uh, Federal Savings and Loan Company. <laughs> what actually happened was that the person disciplined his own spending. When he wanted to spend, he stopped and thought. He feared debt. And as Benjamin Franklin pointed out, debt is one of the most terrible adversaries in the world. It is one of the prime causes of worry in, among human beings. But because the individual realized that he had to prepare his own future, he kept a watchful eye upon his goods. The family practiced common thrift. It was not usual or natural to waste anything. The individual gained gradually the knack of repairing broken things. He found that it was possible for him to keep his own house in reasonable order. He painted it himself and he shingled it himself. And if the task was more than one person could do, the neighbors moved in and helped him on a cooperative basis that the next neighbor when in trouble would receive also the same help from us. This meant that a frugality was common, that the person, uh, most of all, had the courage and the personal character to keep for himself the rules that he knew were good for him. Today, this situation has virtually disappeared in most so-called progressive civilizations. We no longer keep rules because we no longer believe in them. And looking around us in society, we find such a chaos that it is difficult to discern any rules or any patterns that are adequate to our needs. 
Little by little, the individual has fallen into a more or less complete dependency upon situations. As the situations change, the individual is happy if they change favorably and unhappy if they change miserably. But where rules are absent in our own lives and absent in the lives of those around us, it is very difficult to organize any kind of a secure culture. The individual is not only a victim of his own weakness, but the victim of the common weaknesses of those around him. By degrees, therefore, it has become evident that the primary weakness of our way of life is that the person cannot or will not or does not lead his own conduct. He does not do these things which he knows are best for him. And while it may be that what is best is more or less obscured today by the congestion of conditions, it is not true that we have no framework of principles, no basic ground upon which to build an adequate code. We have received from the past excellent instruction in patterned living. We know that the great religions of the world all have essentially the same ethical moral structures. We also know that where nations or individuals fall away from these codes of structure, these nations or individuals come to grief. We have plenty of object lessons around us to reveal the fact that the undisciplined career ends in chaos. We have every type of instruction that we need if we are observant, if we give it consideration, or if we apply to ourselves the difficulties which we see in other people and realize that we are subject to the same infirmities. So I think the beginning of all counseling, and as far as that is concerned, the whole counseling procedure is based upon one factor, and if this factor is absent, uh, very little success can ever be hoped for. The individual must have the strength to do that which is necessary. There must be a resolution, a determination, a decision within the person that he is going to make use of his own internal resources. Whether he calls these resources religious, religious or secular is perhaps of secondary consideration. But the individual who does not lead his own character will nearly always follow the mistakes of others. Now, the uh, problem of leading character always implies, of course, that we have some kind of character worth leading. Therefore, we must search within our own natures to find out the principles upon which life operates. And having discovered a few of these basic principles, we must, uh, we must apply them continuously. In all human relationships, the greatest cause of trouble in actual practice is self-interest. The individual becoming completely self-centered, concerned only with his own most favorable concerns, and cheerfully willing to sacrifice both principles and other persons for the achievement of that which he wants. This person is uh, the one who is in uh, line for the greatest amount of psychological difficulty. Self-interest in the sense of believing that it is possible for any person to be happy at the expense of someone else is a fallacy. It has never succeeded and it never will. Self-interest conceals itself under innumerable guises and excuses. But under any name and on any form, the individual who places his own physical advantages, 
his own career, his own creature comforts, and his own opinions above the res no normal responsibilities of good relationship will have trouble, and plenty of it. Perhaps uh, the next uh, thing that we discover is that in every human being there is a subconscious stratum of evasion. The individual faced with a problem seems to panic, and the only uh, solution that he thinks of is to blame the problem on someone else. If he is in trouble, he must either change himself, recognizing his own nature to be at fault, or he must try to change someone else so that their conduct will conform with his pleasure. Changing ourselves is a possibility. Changing other people a virtual impossibility. In the first place, we have no way of knowing uh, that we can change people for their own good. And to change them for our good alone is the ultimate form of selfishness. Also in this problem of trying to avoid or evade responsibility for our own conduct, we rush into generalities. Uh, we begin to look for causes outside of ourselves. Naturally, if we are so inclined, we can find plenty of them. A great many persons feel that they would be much happier if the world was happier. Uh, perhaps there is a modicum of truth in it, but let us also remember that the world is going to remain as it is until individuals change themselves. Consequently, uh, the ability to accept the responsibility for conduct contrary to prevailing custom is important to each of us. Also, I have noticed that individuals with small problems which they might solve, but which they have no intention of working with, immediately run away to vast problems which they cannot solve, and which therefore become a good excuse for personal failure. If, for example, an individual is having trouble with his neighbor, he may very well take on vast social projects and try to reform the universe. In these large projects, he has no hope of success, but he finds a sort of dignified reason for being a failure. Uh, it's not so bad to fail in a cause that couldn't succeed. That sort of martyrdom, it gives us a rather rich feeling of self-sacrifice. But to fail in some common error of temperament or disposition is not such an honorable thing. Consequently, we turn from our personal problems to larger ones as a means of evading immediate action and personal responsibility. This situation uh, is everywhere obvious in our way of life. The person must sometime come to the realization that there is within his own nature a guiding principle. The individual can be contaminated by circumstances, but it is very rare indeed to find one who is contaminated to the very core of his nature. There is within every human being those qualities which make him human. He may desecrate these qualities and he may pervert them, but they are nevertheless present and potentially available if he wants to use them. Consequently, in each of us there is a capacity uh, to direct our own lives. We have everything that is necessary to make the changes that are needed. 
But we find that calling upon these resources and doing these things will interfere with the common appetite sensory interests which we have developed. We find that it takes a little time, perhaps, to think things through. And we now say we have no time. It may take a little energy to energize our own motivations, and we complain today that with all our vitamins we are tired all the time. It may take a little courage and dedication to alter the patterns of our own conduct, and this courage and dedication seems to be an exhausting uh, demand. It is just something more than we can be reasonably expected uh, to accomplish. Thus we seemingly are weaker and weaker on the outside every day. It becomes almost impossible for us to cross our own ambitions or our own opinions in anything. What we feel, we do. What we think, we finally believe, and uh, the whole pattern of life is lived from this inevitability of impulse. Whatever impulse we have, this is it. If impulse tells us to drink ourselves to death, we will do so. If impulse tells us to strike our neighbor, we will do so. The only time that impulse is frustrated at all is when it comes a foul of man-made law. If we decide that if we strike our neighbor, it's going to cost us fifty dollars, we probably will hold back the blow. Sometimes, however, in anger, we forget even this. But there seems to be no way in which the individual can actually sense the possibility of doing well and happily that which he does not want to do. And as time has gone on, and the general level of our culture has slowly fallen, the individual nearly always wants to do those things which are not good for him. Now, how are we going to break this situation? We no longer have the authority of religion to force us, more or less, to recognize uh, that we can get into serious spiritual difficulty by failing to maintain a proper level of conduct. We no longer have the philosophical incentives by which we can rationally discover the reason for the need of virtue. We do not gain from our scientific education anything that is especially valuable on an ethical level. There seems to be no way in which the individual is encouraged Uh, to develop strength of character. There is one way, of course, which is supreme, but which he ignores. And that is the real reason why we need strength of character is because we are miserable without it. Strength of character is necessary to survival. It is necessary to the final accomplishment of anything worthwhile in life. We have therefore the immediate inducement of realizing that our weaknesses are our undoing, and that in the presence of them, all other forms of success and happiness, so-called, will ultimately be sacrificed. Now, how are we going to get this strength of character? It is a question in my mind whether... Uh, counseling as we know it today can really achieve this end because it is simply another form of leading. Uh, The individual moving from childhood toward maturity is supposed to move from dependence to self-reliance. The peculiar symbol of maturity is that the individual is now prepared to accept a reasonable amount of personal responsibility. He is now supposedly in a condition of consciousness which will enable him to stand on his own feet and do the things that are necessary for his well-being. 
as he emerges from shelteredness, from the fact that the parent pays the bills, the parent provides the means and the living, that the parent is always available for some kind of help in emergency, and that the parent has, consciously or unconsciously, taken over a large part of the mental and emotional guidance of the growing child. Due to all these circumstances, which in themselves are ancient and proper within reason, the young person suddenly emerging into maturity uh, has to make an adjustment, the adjustment for which he should have been prepared from the beginning, for all counsel, help, guidance, and education which he has received have been given for the purpose of helping him to be an adult human being. Today, because of the very nature of conditions and the way in which our various policies are administered, we have no longer any clear line of demarcation between childhood and maturity. As a result, we are flooded or overwhelmed with a mass of perpetual adolescence. These individuals have grown up to the point where they are physically empowered to vote, where they are assumed to be able to found homes and raise families and again a useful occupation. But a large number of these persons are actually small children psychologically. They are afraid of responsibility. They have not learned to share anything they have not recognized the importance of giving of themselves. And to them, the future is merely a continuous opportunity to take advantage of other people and other conditions. As a result, they start out on the level of maturity, hopelessly unable to stand on their own feet. And if it so happens that they escape from the parent from the leadership of the, of the elder, they begin to turn to other forms of the elder for continued parental guidance. And in a large way, the counselor takes the place of the parent. The counselor now becomes a, a kind of philosophic father. To this counselor, the individual wants to bring all his troubles and all his difficulties. He has a certain respect for the counselor. He believes that probably the counselor can help him. But he wants the counselor to do almost everything for him. And, of course, no counselor can do this. The counselor can recommend, but he cannot enforce. The counselor may be able to help the individual to have a better insight into his own nature, but if the individual doesn't care about this insight and it doesn't mean anything to him as an inspiration to personal action, then the entire procedure is wasted. The counselor, therefore, being a kind of second parent, not knowing what to do with a wayward child, which most of his clients finally uh, appear to be wayward children, he finds whatever means he can uh, to subdue the, in, uh, the inordinate pressures which the adolescent always has. We speak of adolescence as a most disturbed period in life. During these years, young people are rather unpredictable. They do not know their own natures. They are subject to forces and pressures moving within themselves which they cannot always control. And as a result, these are dangerous years. But when the person reaches maturity and this same adolescent pressure continues, uh, then the probability of a good life um, is seriously damaged. The only way in which excessive pressures today uh, can be treated, apparently, without some help from the pressureful person himself is through sedational medication. The individual is simply doped into a stupor. He is able to relax simply because he loses the power to remember his own tensions. 
His nerve stimuli are reduced and inhibited and impaired in the effort to try to make him a little bit easier for himself and other people. Obviously, such process of medication cannot be continuous, and if it is extended for any great length of time, there is definite evidence of damage. The individual gradually lowers his own resistances simply because uh, they are not called upon even in common ways. And when finally medication is no longer possible, the individual finds that his willpower and his decisional fac faculties have been injured by the very medication itself. So we have no solution here. There is no solution for the individual who intends to do nothing himself, but expects to depend upon a welfare state to think for him, hope for him, remove all causes of worry and responsibility, and carry him, so to say, on a pillow down through the years until retirement takes over and he has a pension. <laughs> this type of living will only continue to weaken society more than it is now weakened, and will make the person less and less capable of any self-help, which is the secret of the whole thing. One of the advantages of the careful and thoughtful study of religion or philosophy is that it helps the individual to sell himself the idea of an ordered universe. The purpose of religion is to reveal to the individual that he lives under a divine plan of things and that his final adjustment must be to this plan that as long as he disobeys the pattern of the divine purpose, he cannot hope to be happy. He thus has a kind of spiritually rational incentive, an incentive which has helped and has directed a great many persons on their way to security. From philosophy he gains an understanding of morality and ethics, uh, from philosophy he comes to know those rules of conduct which strengthen society and those which weaken society. If he becomes sincerely converted to either a, an enlightened religion or an idealistic philosophy, he will gradually be impelled or inspired uh, to modify his conduct into harmony with his belief. At least this is the common hope. But I have observed that a great many persons can study religion and philosophy all their lives and have absolutely no greater power to control some small selfish attitude of their own. It does not automatically produce a uh, remedy, but it does have a tendency to cause the individual uh, to believe in the importance of remedy. Both religion and philosophy, but especially religion, helps the person uh, through certain spiritual conviction. Uh, prayer, for example, uh, gives to the sincere person who believes in its efficacy an additional source of strength. It helps this person to believe that there is a power available to help him if he will help himself. Thus, through the addition of an outside spiritual source of strength, the person finds that his own strength seemingly increases. And out of this increase comes in many instances uh, the deciding factor by which the person can <laughs> conquer a a bad habit or a wrong attitude. <clears throat> Thus we learn from the beginning that the essential importance of religion and philosophy comes from their cultivation of the internal life of the person. He begins to have a clearer sense of internal directive. 
If this directive is based upon any worthwhile belief, it will help him to lead his own conduct. He must gain this facility if he is to accomplish anything that is good and proper. At this time in this country, the number of individuals in need of psychological assistance, so-called, is so great uh, that we cannot hope to graduate in the next hundred years enough psychologists to take care of them. Psychology is moving into every field of human activity. It is becoming important in business and in all professions. It has even entered into the advertising field, and I think something should be done to prevent this, because it is being actually used to create the very um, appetites and the very unreasonable patterns uh, which it's itself, as psychology, it was devised to remedy. But in any event, the average citizen is not going to be able to have adequate psychological help according to our way of giving it, even assuming that the psychology itself was all sufficient, which is not true. It is helpful, but it is not a universal panacea. Consequently, we are going to have in this country increasing numbers of persons uh, more every year who will have psychological problems which they cannot hope to present uh, to a qualified psychologist. They also, many of them, have temperaments which would not permit them to go to a psychologist even when in trouble. The individual in trouble very often finds ways to evade his own responsibility and denies the very sickness which is within him. <coughs> the third factor, of course, is economic. Due to the very nature of psychology and the time factors involved, it is an expensive procedure. It cannot be otherwise. It is impossible to adequately socialize it. It is not something that we can provide to every citizen because of the fact of the vast amount of time involved in each case. There just is not enough wealth, enough time, or enough professionally trained persons. Thus, the uh, individual uh, can only hope for inadequate guidance in this area, that is, the majority. A small group will always have the means and the time and the inclination, but the greater number will not be able to benefit from availing facility, available facilities. Also, the question arises, is this necessary? What really happens? One of the most common problems that arises in psychology, of course, is dependency. The individual becomes dependent upon psychological help in the same way that he becomes dependent upon sedation or stimulant. He gradually becomes more and more involved in a, in a habit-forming technique, where actually uh, the habit of rushing to a professional counselor with every mental and emotional ache and pain is merely an evasion or an escape mechanism. The second problem that always arises is the danger of transference. Uh, the unhappy person turning to the psychologist for help gradually becomes more and more personally involved until perhaps in the end a very difficult situation results. All these difficulties and many more point out the need for a rather different approach to this entire problem. And through a good many years, I have been working on this different approach, and have found it to be comparatively helpful. First of all, it would seem to me uh, that in psychology, as in everything else, the troubled person should be encouraged from the beginning to stand on his own feet. Now, he may be uh, seeking help because he does not believe his own feet will support him. Perhaps they will not at the particular moment, 
but with some assistance they can be made to support him. Consequently, I have a feeling that there is a very great need in this country for a brief, integrated form of counseling. The type of counseling that perhaps is traceable back to the old oracles of Greece or to the great religio-philosophic systems of antiquity. In the first place, I think the individual could be worked with in somewhat the following manner. Namely, that a clinic or clinics be set up in this country on the basis of single session uh, counseling. In other words, the individual attending such a clinic or going to such a place will receive only one appointment to last not more than one hour. <coughs> He cannot come back the next day. He cannot uh, have any of the uh, long planned, long drawn out recommendations that have previously generally applied. He will come with his principal problem. He will express it and will receive guidance. He will be told in the simplest possible words the most practical answer to his difficulty. I think that we will find that it is not necessary in most cases to find out that the child fell on its head when it was a year old, and that from that time on it is psychologically predestined to be miserable. I think all this long a uh, difficult type of probing is valuable only in certain types of cases which are uh, not at all common. What the average person is dying of at the present time is the lack of common sense. <laughs> uh, we have gradually educated common sense out of the practical sciences. We have now made it so that no one involved knows what the facts really are. But the average person uh, has a problem which is symbolical in some way of an accumulation within his own consciousness. The crisis which he faces at any given time is a symptom of his entire psychological integration. What we can learn in a comparatively few moments is probably all we need to know at any given time. The individual having a problem and seeking help in that problem can receive and should receive the keys not only to the solution of that problem, but a brief statement of the patterns of his own life which are mostly responsible for the situation he is in. I think that before such an appointment is made, that the uh, prospective uh, client should receive a short and well-written folder, a folder which explains and describes the entire process involved, that the purpose of the entire session is to create between a counselor and his client a simple realization that it is up to the client, that the counselor is a person who has a sufficient general knowledge and has this important separate point of view, which is the one valuable thing. The counselor, like the judge, must have the detachment in which it is possible to view principles and to see exactly what the basic difficulty really is. If the uh, patient or the client is instructed that the entire procedure will be summarized by the recommendation of an immediate procedure that the patient 
is to follow that procedure. That the patient is to build his own strength in himself. And if he does return a second time, it is only to tell the counselor how well he has succeeded, nothing else. The individual who wishes, therefore, to make a life of being a psychological neurotic, who wishes to spend the rest of his years wandering from one psychologist to another, might begin to realize that he is simply wasting other people's time and his own. Get uh, a little bit of real, serious fact into this situation. <laughs> if the individual is willing to take over the advice that has been given to him and use it, or is able to gain some <coughs> comprehension of the principles which are briefly summarized for him, he probably can carry on himself from that point. It is not necessary for him to keep going back again and again. And let us point out that a problem is part of a long chain of chain reactions. If the individual, for example, has a wicked tongue, as some do, uh, this problem is only one link in a long chain of difficulties. There are all kinds of excuses for why the person is unable uh, to curb his own remarks. But all of the chain is dependent upon the link which at the present moment has brought the sufferer in desperation in search of help. The very way in which he can solve this problem becomes the clear guide to the solution of every other problem. The moment he can realize that he does not have to have the bad habit of gossiping, he will also discover that he does not have to have any other bad habit that the same attitude which will correct this will correct all others, or most of them. For the whole situation simply means that the subject is inspired to take over the management of his own life and the correction of his own mistakes. If he goes to a person whom he deeply and devoutly respects, if he feels that this person does know and this person tells him what to do. What more can any counselor accomplish, actually? The patient can come back and be told the same thing 500 times. But if he knows this, he is going to delay making the correction. He is going to continuously hope that the psychologist is a magician who can achieve the reformation of another person's character in spite of themselves. This is not true. So from the very beginning we go back to the ancient concept of guidance. That a word to the wise is sufficient. And if the individual cannot do anything with that word, he is not going to do much with ten times that word. <laughs> He is not going to take hold of the situation unless the condition in his own life is ripe. That is, it has reached a situation which he can no longer endure. He must do something. If he then does that which is immediately proper, he starts himself on a completely new course of life. He discovers, for example, something that Western man has never really discovered, namely that no one has to be miserable. Now it is very possible that in these single session counselings, it is may be that certain lines of study can be also recommended. 
whereby the person can gradually gain the insight that he needs to manage his own affairs. Actually, all help must be instruction of some kind, and the person must be able to accept and use instruction. He is more likely to accept it, and he is more likely to use it if it is difficult to obtain. If he realizes that he has one chance, and that is all, he will do more to attempt to work out his problem. If, however, he believes that he can drop back upon a vast scientific structure that will hold him up for the rest of his life if necessary, he is defeating his own purpose and the purposes of counseling. It would therefore appear that while we cannot say that all cases can respond uh, to the impact of single sessions. I believe that 80% of cases can be helped in this way. <coughs> it may well be that all 80% will not be cured, but they will be assisted, and a large percent will find permanent benefit. I am receiving letters now of appreciation from people who had one one-hour session with me 35 years ago. They never needed any more. It was not what I did for them. It was merely the fact that they took hold of certain principles and began to use them. And by using the principles, they began to put order into their own conduct. The most simple instruction, the most universal instruction that must be brought upon the person or given to him in counseling is the realization that he can correct his own ways. He does not have to have any habit or attitude that he does not believe to be helpful. How are we going to create the necessary self-leadership to make such a discovery stick? Those in a crisis may accept the idea simply because they are desperate. But there are many, many millions who are gradually working themselves into desperate situations, who could be saved from these crises if they would use a little preventive self-discipline. Now, self-discipline is just exactly as much a habit as the general lack of it is a habit. <coughs> self-discipline has to be cultivated. It has to be learned and worked with just exactly in the same way that all persons must use self-discipline in order to establish themselves successfully in any profession or trade. A musician must subject, must subject himself to self-discipline. Without it, he can never be a competent performer. All forms of business require that the individual gradually accepts the responsibility of that business, disciplines his own mind against various negative attitudes, controls his instinct to be somewhere else when he should be in the office, and also has the courage and the stamina to gain whatever knowledge is necessary by study or otherwise to advance his career. He has to impose certain disciplines upon himself, or he will never get anywhere in anything. A mother with children has to impose not only disciplines upon the children, but upon herself. If she does not, ultimately the children will no longer respond to discipline. In every activity in which we are engaged, we must control and direct our own action in that direction which seems to be most necessary or best for all concerned. No individual who is not interested in disciplining himself should take up a psychologist's time. 
No individual whose only attitude in life is, I can't do anything, should expect anything except the troubles he's in. This idea of being helpless and happy has become too prevalent in our modern thinking. There are many ways in which we can gradually create the habit of discipline. Confucius usually advised us not to head directly into our major problem, because it is there that apparently our greatest stress and strain will be found, and the greatest resistance to change. Therefore, as long as we know that we must sometime be strong enough to take care of the problem, we begin with some general exercises to encourage and increase strength and character. One of the simplest disciplines that we can all impose upon ourselves is the regulation of the common events of life. The discipline of being punctual in all appointments and in all business activities. Uh, the discipline of doing things which are of first importance first, regardless of interruptions. Uh, the self-discipline of not allowing our major projects to be altered by passing events and circumstances. The self-discipline that is imposed by the individual upon his personal habits, such as eating, drinking, things of this nature. All of these are simple projects in self-discipline. And gradually we discover something that we do not really believe we have, and that is the power to control ourselves. All psychology must develop this power, but it is not to be developed by pressure or by tyranny. We are not to whip ourselves. We are not to create further neurotic pressure and tension by locking ourselves in a terrible struggle with circumstances. The simple problem is to quietly do that which we have found to be right and necessary when it is right and necessary. Procrastination is a destruction of discipline. To put off things to some other time when they should be done now, is to continually weaken our own morality. Many of these little things have no apparent meaning, but they all add up to the fact that we are the hopeless servant of impulse, that whatever we feel like doing, we must do. Whatever we feel like having, we must have, regardless of whether we can afford these things or not. The gradual modification of life, to keep it within the reasonable bounds of income is a powerful self-discipline. The uh, ability to withstand the pressure of luxury when we realize that we cannot afford these things without incurring serious debt. This is self-discipline. To gradually put the various phases of life in an orderly pattern will not only give us the strength to meet crisis, but in the majority of cases will prevent crisis. For crisis nearly always follows a long time devoted uh, to gratification of impulse and instinct. Discipline also can apply to new things uh, that we plan to accomplish. Discipline implies the importance of honesty in basic undertaking. The individual who is constantly attempting to use ulterior motives to attain his own end will ultimately land on the psychologist's couch. We cannot live by ulterior motives. We can seemingly flourish for a little time and then the whole world of which we are a part falls to pieces. People who cultivate friends for ulterior purposes, or who marry for ulterior purposes, or who try to put on a necessary display to over-influence other people, are gradually undermining their own peace of mind and their own peace of soul. Unless they are willing to face this, unless they are willing to do something about it, 
What can any line of therapy actually promise them? It is useless to say that we can cure extravagance by causing the individual to become unconscious and in this state, of course, have no instinct to spend anything. This is no answer. Nor is there any answer in hoping that we can cut some fiber in the brain so that from that time the individual will live modestly. Major surgery to get over stupidity. If it comes to this, it might be just as well for the human race to become extinct. It really has no reason to continue. For the very purpose of man's humanity is that he shall develop the potentials of his own nature which are greater than the potentials of any other creature known to man. If he does nothing with them, he has no right to feel that he is entitled to peace or security or happiness or health. So out of a problem, we come to the same thing that happened in the old days when the troubled individual went to one of the prophets in the wilderness or something uh, of this nature or entered into the temple of his god or the sanctuary of his uh, patron muse and there besought help. He asked for guidance, I uh, asked for understanding or insight, and usually the great uh, thundering mystery of religion, whatever it might be, uh, uttered a very brief oracle on these subjects, simply stating, this thou shalt do, and this thou shalt not do. Very discouraging today. <laughs> Today we do not want this type of suggestion. What we want to be told is that we don't have to do anything ourselves except perhaps a moderate payment and that all else will be taken care of for us. Every decision of life can be made for the individual if he has enough money to pay for the decisions. But when he gets through, what has he got? a hopeless polygot of, conf of confusion, conflict, and further disillusionment. Because these decisions cannot be made by other people. They have to arise out of our own integration. So we would think very definitely uh, that there are certain basic rules. There are certain things every young person should know. Now, having learned them or having known them, we cannot say that he will follow them. But we do know that if he does not follow them, he will ultimately regret it. We know the same thing of persons in every walk of life. And we realize that for one reason or another, we are forever compromising these basic principles. As long as we compromise them, our own troubles will increase. Those who do still have or are developing a certain religious strength who are beginning to become more internally aware of the presence of a divine principle in themselves have a certain additional instrument of understanding to help them to manifest their own inner realities. And this in turn can lead to the gradual development of moral and ethical concepts of living which the individual can use to guide his own conduct. They are very simple principles. Uh, they are uh, not too numerous in number. Uh, they are very essential and very elementary. Yet by keeping them, we ensure most of the other good things that we really want in life. So it seems that all counseling adds up to one simple situation. Is the individual ready, ready to work to become what he should be? If he's not ready to work, he hasn't suffered enough yet. And there's no one that can force him to work. If he is ready to assume personal responsibility 
for his conduct, all he needs in the majority of instances is a basic suggestion on how to proceed. This suggestion depends largely, of course, on his own problem. But it does mean that he is seeking help because he expects to use that help. That he expects to take this instruction and apply it himself. If we could get more people to think a little bit in this direction, uh, we would have a much better scientific situation. Uh, those who are trained would be free to take care of those who really need them. And this endless uh, procession of neo-neurotics would not be uh, troubling us as it is at the present time. Neurotics are, are selfish, self-centered people who have been hurt by life because they have never really understood their own place in it. If they can wake up and get hold of the situations, uh, they can solve their own problems instead of nursing their own grievances. Very poor policy to nurse grievances. It is very poor to regret that which cannot be changed. It is very poor to permit any incident in life to completely overwhelm living. These things just indicate lack of resource, lack of ability uh, to move forward into some more constructive relationship. Once the person is a little of the mind to take over his own situations, he can make quite a good job of it. It can become one of the most fascinating endeavors in which man can be engaged. Some people feel that the person who is working hard on himself to do something with his own nature is rather selfish and self-centered, but those who live around him will excuse this gladly if it produces any improvement in him. <laughs> For actually, the greatest good we can confer upon others is to stop hurting them. And the only way we can stop hurting other people is to stop hurting ourselves, is to stop making these basic mistakes from which all must suffer together. We hear every day uh, evidences of thoughtlessness, and a great many problems begin in thoughtlessness, which must then be defended. And gradually, thoughtlessness becoming a habit uh, proceeds to make life miserable for other people. We do realize the basic laws of society. We realize what is meant by graciousness, by civility, uh, by understanding in terms of this nature. And uh, we are required to practice these powers because we have been endowed with them. And if we have certain potentials within our own nature, we must use them in order to perfect our own nature. Until we take on this task, we ourselves are delinquent. The uh, problem of the single session concept uh, is also uh, subject to certain modifications within its own structure. Actually, many individuals can have this one-hour session with themselves if they really are concerned. Uh, this is a little more difficult because we don't have faith in our own judgment. Uh, we do not have this sense of support that we get if someone else uh, is brought in for objective, impartial consideration. But if for one reason or another, and certainly there is every reason today, the proper type of counseling is not available to us, there is not that type of guidance which can summarize things and throw them at us then uh, we do have certain capacities to do these things ourselves. Ultimately, man will solve all of his own problems. It is necessary and inevitable that such will be the case. But at the, in the transition period, this is not easy. But nearly everyone who is in a difficulty can quietly 
uh, sit down and decide where to attack that difficulty. He can decide which one of his common habits is most obnoxious to himself and others. And he can settle down to the quiet problem of thoughtfulness in connection with this problem. Discipline then means continuing thoughtfulness about a tendency or an impulse that is not good. The individual can guard against it. He can build protective defenses in his own consciousness against this particular fault. And he can also be just a little slower in his attitudes to give himself time to analyze and weigh what he is thinking or saying. In a very short time, uh, these, these directives, these uh, controls become automatic. And the individual, for instance, who has a bad temper, if he will control that temper by quiet understanding, insight, and self-discipline for three months, we'll have no further trouble with it. Once it knows that he is master, temper itself subsides. It grows upon every single explosion. The individual has one temper fit. This doesn't mean too much. He has several of them. The habit is forming. And if he has 20 years of them, the habit is well set. But the fact that he has the habit does not mean that he is a different kind of human being who must have temper fits or expire. It does not mean that he is created with a disposition in which the infinite intended him to have temper fits. It does not mean that he cannot do anything about them. It means that he has a poor habit, long established. A habit of responding in a belligerent or unpleasant manner to many of the stimuli of life. This person can quietly take over the situation and cure it himself. He can quietly decide what kind of disposition would be better for him and all others concerned and cultivate it. Naturally, there will be a certain amount of, a, of initial uh, resistance to change. This is true of everything. We cannot expect to float immediately into a new level of existence without any adjustment. It cannot be effortless in the last analysis, but it can be accomplished with much less effort than we think, because up to now probably we've used no effort at all, so we have no way of knowing how much personal uh, libido is going to be necessary. In sober fact, a very little effort will gradually change a habit, because an effort is a self-directive, the habit is not. And in a comparatively short period of watchfulness, the individual will not only have the power to improve himself, but by observing the natural benefits of the improvement will have new enthusiasm to continue his efforts. Nothing succeeds like success, and success is always the result of some kind of a continued effort maintained until new habits of conduct are established. So we have a certain amount of initial resistance. Uh, we will have to fight a few times to find out who is master, whether we live to gratify temper or whether temper represents a minor error in our own constitution. If we simply live to energize temper fits, we will have the inevitable dangers of coronaries and so on, which arise from such explosions, and certainly will lose friends and family, and perhaps uh, compromise or destroy a good economic future. There is every reason to take hold of these things. But unless we do take hold of them, uh, we cannot hope to cure them. No person can hope to improve if he is not willing to make any kind of a decent effort. 
Now, effort is not, should not be directed toward forgetfulness of the problem. In other words, we should not try to ignore it, keep on having it, and try to live in some outside relationship with it. The individual has a bad temperament or bad temper, cannot simply say, I'm just going on, have the bad temper, ignore it, and bluff my way through. This won't work. Nor will we gain too much by making artificial or imaginary interest to take care of our own self-boredom. Things have to be real. They have to be valid and they have to be important. But each person, particular job, is to pick out the problem that is now giving him the greatest cause of trouble and go to work on it. If he wants to uh, achieve a, a major correction in this way, he can do so. With this same problem comes the opportunity to enlarge interests, uh, to gain greater insight into values, to study philosophy and religion, to take over arts and cultures that will enrich life, because many individuals who are in serious mental-emotional trouble are simply there because of mental and emotional idleness. The person who has no real reasons to be alive does not make much of a job out of living. The individual whose life is so devoid of real interests that he has hour after hour to spend being sorry for himself will never solve his problem until he develops interests that are valid, things that are important to him more important than himself and self-pity. Whatever be the situation that is revealed as being necessary, this situation should be taken in hand. Very often we can find outlets by means of which we can become more constructively employed or more active in various pursuits. If, however, outside activities are more or less denied or inadequate, then we have to also learn that man is so constituted that he can have a completely important and satisfying internal life, that he has within himself faculties and powers which can intrigue him and inform him throughout life, that the tremendous potential of his own nature is something he can never exhaust. Therefore, there is every type of internal self-culture available to him. There are many activities which will have immediate reward for him. But if he has this peculiarly static attitude of not being able to do anything, then he is in a crisis because nature is using its only method to achieve the breaking up of stasis. The trouble we are in sometimes is simply nature breaking up crystallization. We have set ourselves in a pattern that is wrong. We have refused to change that pattern or felt ourselves totally helpless to do so. Nature, therefore, moves in and begins to pound on this pattern. It makes the pattern unendurable because nature must do this in order that the being within the pattern may survive. Little by little it becomes more difficult to bear the pattern. The individual still, however, is not inclined to make any personal effort to change it. The situation gets heavier and heavier, and the person's sicker and sicker, <coughs> but he still desperately clings to his own inertia. He does not want to make effort. If he makes any effort at all, it must be merely to fulfill or gratify some appetite of his own. So nature is doing this, this breaking up, this forcing of situations, because every individual must ultimately become desperate enough to change himself. 
Now, there's no law in nature that says we have to wait till the last bitter end to do this. We can start in the moment symptoms appear. In physical ailments, the best way and best time to treat some form of ailment is when its first symptom shows up. If we wait until it has destroyed half the fabric of the body, it may be too late to apply a remedy. Therefore, the moment an undesirable habit shows up in ourselves, the moment we do something we're ashamed of, the moment we have to say to ourselves, I wish I hadn't said that, or I wish I hadn't done that, or I wish I'd had more understanding, I wish I'd treated that person better, but he's dead now and I can't do anything about it. The moment we begin to feel this type of wishing in our own nature, it's a sign there's work to do and plenty of it. In order to achieve the larger part of this work, we therefore take hold of things even when they do not appear to be emergencies. And by taking hold of them and regulating them correctly, we prevent emergencies. I believe a complete system of counseling can be built upon this very simple pattern. A simple pattern of an individual who seriously wants help may not have the detachment and freedom from involvement to see all of the elements clearly. Therefore, what he really wants is an accurate diagnosis, a diagnosis not of his total nature, this goes on and on, but a diagnosis of the first things he must do to break such habits as are breaking him. Once he sees this pattern and becomes aware of it, it is then up to him to use it if he so desires. If he doesn't use it, no one is to blame but himself. If he does use it, however, he will suddenly discover that it is the key to a universal learning. For the attitudes which will correct a single problem will, if developed and variously applied, correct ultimately the primary problem, which is always man's inability uh, to control himself. So once we start, sincerely, we can achieve the end. And what we need is encouragement, is a good straight statement of facts that, do, that does not insult our intelligence, we want to know what is wrong and what to do about it. And armed with this equipment, we can restore the native dignity of individual accomplishment. Because actually, the ultimate welfare state is the one in which each individual protects his own welfare and guards the welfare of others. So that each way we look at this, we come back to the same general purpose that the end of all counseling is to give man the power uh, to be victorious over the circumstances of his own conduct. And if this is brought home at all stages of life by simple, direct application to immediate crisis, I think the majority of people will get the psychological help they need much more rapidly and much more effectively than by the complicated methods now generally employed. Well, time's up, folks. We have to start. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that last evening, the, uh, yesterday, the friends had a very interesting and fine party, and we, uh, uh, the committee wishes to thank all the party workers and guests with special appreciation to the hostess, Mrs. Barry, for the loan of her home to make the October 5th event the success that it was. More than uh, 100 persons attended this buffet, and uh, out of this endeavor, uh, the sum of $250 for the retiral of the mortgage was accomplished. So we want to thank all these people for their good help on this occasion. 
We have a new exhibit today in the library which we think you will find interesting. It has to do with uh, Indian and Persian miniatures and paintings and is extremely colorful and uh, some of the paintings quite unusual and rare, and some of the material quite early, so that we hope that you will visit the library for that. I'd like to also mention that uh, from now on uh, to Christmas, our gift shop will be open not only after and before the lectures on Sunday, but before the lectures on Wednesday evening. And here you will have opportunity to uh, look over the various items that we are constantly bringing in for your consideration and to help you simplify your various Christmas and other shopping needs. So we hope that you will visit the gift shop also, where we do likewise have a number of books that you might like to look over. Uh, the uh, announcement of the incompatibility uh, uh, notes on the book table for your consideration. Lecture 53, Psychic Malpractice, is available. Submerged Personalities and Solving Psychic Problems or other publications which might be helpful to you at this particular time. As you probably noted from the program, I will be in Denver next Sunday, so I cannot be with you. And on that occasion, uh, Dr. Drake will take the subject of Carl Jung's memoirs for a book review and interpretation, The Memories, dr uh, Dreams, and Reflections of C.G. Young. Uh, is a very remarkable book, one of the most intimate uh, denouements of the life of a person. It is a strange book by a very remarkable man, and as his standing in the field of psychology is certainly uh, the highest from an ethical standpoint that we know, I believe this will be an unusual opportunity uh, to go along and consider some of the interesting things that happened in the life of Jung, particularly as these bore upon the development of his psychological techniques. So we think you will have an interesting time next Sunday morning. I also want to call to your attention that if you have friends in Denver, uh, uh, you might drop them a card and tell them that we will be at the Phipps Auditorium next Sunday afternoon. And uh, also, I believe... Uh, they can watch their newspapers for other reports. Now, I want to thank you all very much for being here today. And, uh, part, and uh, pa part of the material that we gave this morning and other material relating upon this same subject will be published in a complete 32-page section which will be added to the winter issue of our journal so that if you're interested in the type of thinking that we have been discussing and other points relative to it, be sure to subscribe to the journal. It will be in the Christmas issue as a special additional factor enlarging the magazine by 32 pages. Thank you very much for being with us this morning.